friends that I'm making today. Um, so so uh, I think this this talk would be mainly um, some sort of conclusion, my my findings and conclusions after years of hanging out with scientists, engineers, like natural scientists, engineers, and social scientists, plus getting into the real world and, and seeing how things might be different. Uh, so being, you know, now being in a social science department, I don't know if this, let's see if this is a good thing or an accomplishment or there it means a failure in engineering. So to a lot of engineers, I was a communist talking too much about humans and the human side of engineering, but you know, I like many others. I started my career as an assistant professor in, in Florida, it's all engineering. And, and later on doing you know, more and more things on the human side and policy, and, and later on, um, finding some, uh, getting into you know, real world and politics and negotiations and seeing how things might be really different from what you said. But even in, in the early work and with game theory, I tried to, you know, to bring up some of the issues with the way we model real world and, and why we might fail. And we are in an area that we have a lot of data and we have a lot of computational power. And, uh, while that's a blessing and that's that's a good thing, um, it can be really scary because, and you know, I'm going to talk about this and why we might be missing some of the um, major points when we get so excited about relations and replication of, of of the past or like you know predicting the future and so on. So, what are the complex things that we're dealing with uh, in human nature systems? So, to begin with, I think. I mean, this is something I hope you remember. If anything from this this talk, and and you know, also I, when I talk about complex human nature system, I, I always use this to say, this is the system we're dealing with. This is the system that our ancestors were dealing with. This is what our grandchildren are dealing with. And in this this you know complex universe, uh, those of us who are, I think you know, still not just very disciplinary. Um, you know, we're, are standing at one of these nodes, and, and some of us who are interdisciplinary and, and claim are very happy about or, or very proud to be, I think, you know, doing some mixed stuff. We're at the intersection of some, you know, some of these other nodes, a bit further from the single node. Um, but what we're dealing with is this system, and and where we are standing, we're probably blind to like we don't see a lot of things because these systems. Um, or, you know, in any system like this, um, you're dealing with bounded rationality. There is no way you can, like, you know, capture every criteria, everything that you, you need and everything that, you know, for decision making. Uh, you, uncertainty is integral to these uh, systems and part of it's a characteristic of, of any system that has human and nature in it. Um, and, and then that gives you limited predictability. So that, you know, to begin with, if you as if you respect the characteristics of these systems, a lot of studies which try to predict the future would become, you know, useless. And especially if you're dealing with with, uh, with these systems. Another issue that we, I think, over time we have realized now, like you know, we're trying to respect. Now we're talking about water, food, energy nexus, like these these mixes. Nothing new, but we we plant stuff and we sell them. But we're dealing with you know causal. In, relationship and interrelated dynamics. So you, you tweak something here, there is an impact over there, there's a feedback over here. And how are you going to deal with this? Or these, these things, do you understand them? Over time, we have failed a lot to learn that there are connections, but there are a lot of connections that we don't know exist because we haven't you know, seen the bad impacts on our decisions. And then evolutionary change. You're dealing with humans. Humans have, like in human systems, have evolutionary changes. You can you know, do something, you know, pass a policy here in, in New York and it works fine, you take it to California and it fails, you take it to another part of the world, there might be a revolution. So, so he, because human systems do not respond in the same way, even identical things and a lot of things that they are the same. And these systems are non stationary So in hydrology and climate, we are now talking about this, but, but this, it, these are the characteristics of these systems. And if we respect these things, our decision would be different and we would be less arrogant. So we're dealing with, with, with the major complexities. And we try to, in this 
this this problem solving. We try to you know do something about one of these things. And as I said, because of those characteristics, instead of claiming that we can't solve the problem, we have to look for ways to address some of the problems without creating new ones. And I think this without creating new ones has not been a concern for a lot of us or the engineering field in the past, and that is why we see a lot of unintended consequences. And, and that exists for why. But, but why? Why why do we face these problems? Why have we created these mistakes, uh, made these mistakes? Because, because when we study systems, because of all the problems that we have, because of the boundary rationality, because of limited data, because of a lot of things, we have to come up with arbitrary system boundaries. There is no way that you can model the whole universe. If you're a modeler, you have to make simplifications. One of the simplifications you make is about the boundaries of your system. So you set boundary conditions at some point, no matter what model you develop. So those boundaries are arbitrary. The, the, the nature, the human systems don't follow your borders or, 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 or your boundaries when you, you, know, you put them into your model. So if you do that, there would be consequences. And, and once you do that, then in your complex system, you might be touching part of the universe and your, you, your understanding of that part of the universe and that part of the complex system might be limited because you're just touching that where you're hanging out in, in part of this system, you're studying part of the system, there is no way you can understand the system. That is why in a lot of things we're failing. I mean, the way we have been modeling or projecting the future of the energy world, like, you know, peak oil, has it reached or not? Like so many studies uh, would be failed by by year 2000. Would we, run in, would we run into food shortage by this year? How would the population dynamics look like? All these predictions that we made, all, like we were so, so sure about that we, we even passed laws, we passed regulations, we did a lot of things about it. We will always fail. And, and I mean, the reason for that is, is that we are dealing with, with a hard problem. You have a wicked problem also. So, so one other thing is like, you know, this, these issues of disciplinary, multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and transdisciplinary. Um, so that we use these terms sometimes interchangeably without distinguishing the difference between these, you know, definitions and why they are different. In an ideal world, we need something transdisciplinary, but there is no way we can get there, if, you know, any soon that like all of us become like the philosophers of, of the, you know, early days that you could like I don't know treat people and also. Uh, to study the stars and do something about, you know, make discoveries in, in math and physics and all that. So, so, and then you add social system and all these. So this is also really scary that we try to go be everything. And the other thing is that we need disciplinary sciences also. So this trend about everyone becoming interdisciplinary is not even healthy and we have to be careful. But, but let's use examples, examples about boundaries. I mean, so, so in the, in the energy world, we all hear about uh, the need for reducing carbon emissions, that's something we understand very well. Um, carbon emissions must be cut, let's go for renewables, let's do this, let's do that. Right? As a person who comes from, you know, with, with a water background, I was concerned at some point in my career about the implications uh, or unintended consequences of our new energy development policies for the water sector. You know, at, some, at that point, I think these, these buzzwords were not out there, like, you know, food, water, energy, nexus, nexus, it's not a term there. And, and these things were, were new. I remember, like, I submitted something to the California Energy Commission, and there, they didn't think it was important. But, but I mean, you know, what is, the, what is the water implication of these energy policies? When you looked at the projections of the major, you know, energy agencies about the future, you know, what, and, and did calculations, we realized that the water footprint of the energy sector, if, if any of these projections about the future is true, is valid, the energy, the water footprint of the energy se sector must increase between 37 to 66 percent, depending on the oil price. If the oil price goes down, you, you know, there's less tendency for developing new renewables. If the oil price goes up, um, there's more, you know, also more tendency to invest in renewables. That's why we see these, you know, gains with with the oil producing company. How they, just, you know, change the change the price and how they, they try to keep their share of the market or even expand the share of the market. But as a water person, 
but like you know we're we're like you know on the media we're talking about no water no water water shortage we're water bankrupt we have a water crisis all that how's that possible where am i going to afford that much water where would i need in the future of the world i need food more food i need more water for the environment i need this i need that and then you go back and and, and think about like who the energy developers? I mean, energy models, integrated assessment models, in need they're called. Do they consider water as a restriction or as a as a as a limit to their projection? Do, do they even understand this? And this is something we didn't understand as engineers at some point in our or, or decision makers that we never thought that, that resources would be a limit to our development. So limit to growth were not like you know was not recognized. But there was one other thing. So 37 to 66 percent. We had this question also, is this because the energy sector is expanding? Because the energy demand is going up, so we need more energy. Or is it because any water, water footprint is, is increasing? And when we did the calculation for each one unit of energy production in the future versus one unit of energy production today, we realized that on average, five to ten, like, you know, future energies would be thirstier and they require more water. Again, something counterintuitive. Is this the right way? Are we trying to solve one problem and create a new problem? A new problem? Is, can we decide for people to be thirstier or like have a better climate or like breathe better? And, and these are the decisions that we have. So, so are the renewables bad? No, not at all. But, but like the question is, are we considering their effects on other sectors, right? And if I expand my boundaries, would, would the result be any different? Right. So the next step was okay. Let's 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 consider a few things. So carbon footprint is, is what they like. Water footprint is what we want to add. But, but how about footprint? How about cost? Of course, cost is the main, you know, the dominant factor for energy production. Then let's go into the literature, and then you face this literature of life cycle assessment and all these footprint games and, and all these publications which are out there. They have a range of different numbers for for the for the performance of different energies on their different criteria, right? So now we are only considering four criteria. By no means, these are the only four criteria that you need to consider. But it, I, we just wanted to add, you know, some stuff to the carbon footprint and see how the results would, would change. Or like, you know, when we consider water, then the results would be different. But look at this. Let's assume that you assign equal weights to these um, criteria and tell me which energies would Perform the best, and and when you see ranges, that means you can reflect the uncertainty in in the range. Tell me which which energy is the best energy based on these numbers, and or it's your ideal energy, or you want to bet on, or you you love, or you like, or whatever. What is that? You want? Yes, but do it. Well, it's a no, 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 I mean, the thing is, there are trade offs. There is no one single energy that you can find which beats every other energy. So, you got so there are, like, I mean, so there is no none which dominates every every other ones in every aspect under every other hand. There are bad ones, of course. But, so, what, what, is, what is about? Okay. And, and and then on the other side, what, what do you think would be the best energies? What do you like to be the best energy? What are you crazy about when you think about renewables? Solar? Nuclear? Nuclear? Uh, Iranian? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is that? I think yeah. so, 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 so when we did the calculation, we were on it too. So we, we came up in this a student was also involved in it. But but it is I mean, so we have to come up with some sort of aggregate foot aggregate footprint calculator, which considers like you know, which tries to um, consider all these trade-offs. What we found was first of all, this this type of aggregate that we have to define. If it's zero, if the performance is zero, the aggregate footprint is zero, it means that energy has won the battle against all other energies under all definitions of optimality. Because we have multiple criteria decision and, you know, making, and there are a bunch of methods, and every method has its own definition of optimal. 
if it's 100, then it means that it has lost the game to all. We don't have an energy which gets zero, which gets 100. So, so no strictly dominated, no strictly dominant in this case. And then you have these performance value um, you know, differences. Some of them are insignificant. So I don't think that nuclear and geothermal, I can say nuclear is the best and geothermal is not. But, but when you look at them, so you see a range of like you know, different performances. What's striking here is something like biomass being in the same category with oil and, and coal. Or large hydro that, that we always believe to be a clean energy, and now we're seeing these stories coming out, or these studies saying, okay, they have a carbon high carbon footprint, land footprint, and so on. And still, people in the developing world are so interested. Politicians love this sort of energy because it's big, it's huge, it's concrete. You can show it, you can take photos, it's power. It, it, you know, see what's happening in Brazil, in China, in the Middle East. So, large scale hydro is actually worse than something like natural gas, or like, you know, the Middle East is sitting on, right? And then, and then, yes, you know, nuclear. Of course, I didn't consider the caveats like you know, the politics, the political cost of it, the social cost of it, whether people like it or not, whether how about safety factors like after Fukushima and all that. But, but the whole thing is when I added a few more criteria, when I expanded my boundaries in a, you know, in a way that I wanted, I got the res different result. And I can mess with this, I can play with it and sell what I like. And that's the scary part. Now, numbers changed in a new study that we did recently, based on the latest numbers in, in the uh, literature, and some improvements to our method. Still, we have this thing here, but we also have had different you know, sort of technology improvement. Uh, Large-scale hydro is doing even worse than before. And, and then you have these you know, top performance over there, which I think is well you know, consistent. But I said equally well. Who am I to say it's equally Why, why equally weighted, right? And, 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 and who am I to say which criteria to, to consider? And now I go and play with, with, the, with the criteria. I say, you know, what if I have carbon only, water only, land only, cost only, cost, you know, uh, carbon water, carbon land, and so on. And then once I do that, you see all these like performance values can, can shift significantly based on what I include and what I exclude. And when I do that, that becomes scary, right? So, so when the performances are like this, they're not robust. So you cannot say they're you know, really good or really bad. It depends on what you consider. And that's the scary part. So for different energy sources, you can see these, these jumps. So that is how our, our scientists can even fool the policymakers or like, you know, as consultants, fool the decision makers, fool the people by telling them what we like to, what, you know, what we like them to hear, right? By, by including criteria, um, the criteria that we want, instead of, instead of something comprehensive. But then again, what is the definition of comprehensive? What is the definition of good thing? To me, if you're going to be talking in front of policy and everything, at the minimum, you have to separate the dollars from the techn technological costs. Like, in other words, budgets of the, of the technology versus if you don't so you have at least two variables. Yeah. So if, if you don't, if you don't mind, let's let's you know discuss oh. it at the end. Yeah. So 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 then you know so cost here is the life cycle cost. So it's it's the, the cost over the production cycle. So it includes everything in, in you know investment and all that. Yes, of course. Then you get into this game of you know if I'm if I'm going to say this is optimal and this is not, but if, for example, if I say nuclear is optimal in your region or it's the best, can you go 100% optimal? How much time do you have as a policymaker? How much budget do you have? When can you implement? What is your current portfolio and so on? So then complexity would be even further. But now I said equally weighted. What if I go from a region to another and look at what they have? You know, the available water resources, their GDP, if, you know, in their region. What is their GDP? If you can't afford it or not. Because someone might be able to afford something at the cost of another thing, or like you know, to pay for for another thing. So, so in South Europe, for example, when the water water you know they have more water shortage, the situation should be different from Northern Europe, right? So maybe Scandinavians can afford having hydropower because they have water, but but some other countries might not be able to do that. So the, then these discussions that we make and these these reports that we we, we release that say that. These energies are the best renewables in the future. 
might not be valid because when you go to a region, now I, I put like different countries and weighted the criteria based on their own resource availability compared to the rest of the world, their carbon budget, looking at their current emission rate, the land availability, the water availability, and so on, then you see that it, even the performances can be variable. Now I get it at the country level. But even if you don't make decisions at the country level, you, you go at a lower scale. So what is this telling you? And I take it now to another region of the world, Middle East. The situation is different. Water is not, is not you know, a, a, a resource available there. Nuclear starts performing worse than before. And then, then you see like whatever is, is, is thirsty is not really good in that region. Some of the countries which are rich can afford more expensive energies. Hydropower, which the region loves, is not the best. I mean, the, the region has built a lot of dams. They're still building a lot of things. So, so, so then the point is, we're not saying what's optimal. I'm not in a place to say that. I just wanted to show what happens when you try to play with game with you can, how you can gain the system, how you can, for a certain range of input, you can get a certain range, range of output. What, if you're an honest researcher, just say, these are my limitations, these are my assumptions, these are my results. You want to change it, change the input, of course you get uh, different results. But so, so energy and economy, the way we were making decisions in the past was based on the cost of it, right? So we had a budget, but then cost. Over time, we realized that we have messed up uh, the climate, like, and, and we have damage, we have cost climate change, and then the concern became cutting carbon footprint. Um, I'm adding water to, you know, as I said, I added water to the calculations, to this, the, the results were different. Now, I combined many other things, they become even, even, even more different. And, and more different. Right? So when you add all these factors to the calculations, to your analysis, your result would be different. So, so the way you look at these problems matter. The way you set your boundaries and which, which, which are these you, you include. Now, what did I include? I didn't include feasibility, whether it's feasible, physically feasible to do a lot of things. I didn't include the transition path, like the dynamics of the transition path. I didn't include social factors. I didn't. Include. So we didn't include a lot of things that would matter in real world. A lot of things that would matter to the policy. And my point is, as we go forward, is, is that a lot of policymakers might know a lot of these things better than we do. And where the problem is like just the challenge of implementation. But what we need to do is, is to think out of the box, normally, you know, and push the boundary to the extent possible. But we cannot, we cannot forever model the whole universe. What we would have for sure is limitations in our studies, or uncertainties in our studies and results and mistakes that we need to be aware of and report in everything that we do. So people know what the consequences and implications of our simplifying assumptions are for their decision. First, uh, shortcoming of the way we, we solve the problems. Now, the second, the second one is, is linear thinking. We think linear. We have been trained, most of us, especially in, in engineering, to, to think linearly. What does it mean? You can use a linear thinking paradigm in this, in this school of thinking. You can use a lot of, um, uh, complex uh, nonlinear mathematical equations. When you say linear thinking, it's not about the math that you use. It's about the way you try to solve the problem. The way we have been, you know, trained to solve the problem is that we're presented with with something with, with the current situation and a desired state. We want to build a skyscraper. Mr. Civil Engineer, come and do it. Uh, we have water shortage in this region. Mr. Civil Engineer, water engineer, come and solve it. We want this, we want that. We want this technology, that technology. So that defines the problem. We come up with the decision that results in the alteration of the environment, and then we got our outcome. This is how we have been trained. This is if you trace it, the way we teach our students, that's the way we do it. What we don't do is to think, you know, we'll tell them normally to think about the, the consequences of the outcome that they're trying to create on, on the problem itself. What if you make this skyscraper here, and that creates like traffic, creates like a boom in the, you know, some sort of demand in the region? I don't know, like effects on the housing price in the region. What if, if, if you're bringing water to this region, uh, you promote development, and, and what if this, what if that, what if that? And would that result in, in new 
redefining the problem and redefining the problem and redefining the problem. That's all we know. One, one example for that, and this is not an example of, of Iran only, but it, we have it in California, we have it now in China, Brazil, a lot of places we have water transfer projects. Middle East, a lot of examples. But this is the city of Isfahan, like you know, a, a basin which holds the city of Isfahan, former capital of Iran. Zayan Derud is a famous river there. Um, the identity of this city is tied to water. So it's like, you know, Thames and, 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 and Lund, for example, right? And then this basin is complex, like many other, you know, complex systems, but it has a high urban demand, high agricultural demand, high industrial demand. It has an ecosystem which is important, a wetland which is preserved on the, you know, listed on the Lonsar Convention, growth of population, and, and then the solution to this region from the very, very old days has been thinking about this rich, you know, water rich basin next door that can donate some water if possible. Right? And this is an attractive area. There's history, pride, like, you know, all these things. And just not, not you know, just behind this mountain, we have, we have some water. So why not bring in water to this region? California, Southern California, people went for for Grove, they started residing there, and then we don't have water, okay, let's bring water from Northern California. Water goes uphill, it's pumped up, and then it goes toward money, towards human settlement. Now, how does this river look like, look like at a moment? This, this is, you know, London without fames, a city which has its identity tied to water, looks like this most of the year. So it causes depression, it causes a lot of problems, it affects the tourism industry, a lot of things. But, but this shows what's, what's going on. So it, and, and, and the politicians hate this situation, hate this situation. So that is why when it's about the anniversary of the Islamic Republic, they open the ballot. Um, yesterday, they even had an order from the president to, to, to you know, have, have water flowing into the river just for the New Year. Right? So, so this is the challenge. So social pressure, political pressure, I just spoke it. Well, essentially, the reason is this basin is water bank. So but we, we brought a lot of water. We more than double, actually, the natural flow of this river through water transfer. Still, we got this problem. Why? And, you know, some, some you know, many years ago, we did the study, and it was 2005, and, you know, early results showing that, that Hey, like, you know, so something is wrong. When you bring in more water, something is going wrong. And we do, I mean, like any other person, I developed a, a complex, uh, you know, so it's, it's a, like, you know, hydrologic model, but I, you know, groundwater, surface water, but I added a part like to its socioeconomic, because when I reached the water demand uh, boundary, I was wondering how do we calculate water demand? How, where, do, where, do, where, do, where does water demand come from and how does the dynamics of water demand, what shapes the dynamics of the water demand? In, in the economics literature, we have like, you know, supply demand curve and, you know, that's how we calculate it. And for engineers, they always give us the demand and we, we, we design for that demand. Sometimes we think about scenarios, like, you know, high demand, medium demand, growth, and, and, and play with that. But, you know, what if we conclude that? And later on, another student came in and add the agricultural demand dynamics. This is not something I can present to the people or the public or, or the decision makers. What we ended up presenting after modeling, graphs, all these publications that we got it, something that really made, made an impact in, in Iran. Um, and, and this is something that a lot of people now talk about. It. I mean, they might abuse it for their own political ends or like, you know, their fights against things. But this was what we ended up with after like, you know, simplifying all those causal loop diagrams, all those complex dynamics. What was it? So the engineers, that's how we solved the problem. We got water scarcity. What's the solution? Whether it's in Iran, in California, wherever. Go bring water wherever you have it. You increase the water supply, you balance it. That's how we think. What we didn't think about or don't think about still is that by providing more water, you promote development. Because normally you don't control what's going on and, and sectors are different. Uh, who, you know, the person or the entity which provides water is not making decisions about population growth or decisions about land development. And then we don't have coordinations 
within the systems normal in, in most, most, most countries. So then you promote development. When you promote development, you have more population, you have more agricultural land, you have more industry, you have more of everything. So your water demand goes up. So do your region becomes thirstier as a result of the water transfer that you make? What is this like? Then you know you have pain in your body because of infection. You take Tylenol instead of antibiotic. Your symptom goes away for a few hours. Your infection gets worse and worse in the system. So, so then we're stuck with a city called Los Angeles, with a region like Silicon Valley, with a lot of places that we cannot ask people to move out, and we are, you know, we have to think about how to provide more water. And then water water transfers become controversial because people in the donor basin also stand up at some point and ask, like, you know, where's this water going and who funded this? Why all of this is because in the way we think. We don't say we know in there. We don't think about the possible unintended consequences, because that's normally not within our area of expertise or within our authority when we make decisions. So, so that is why we cause a lot of new problems. And, but unintended consequences, by definition, are unintended. So you won't be able to find them out, find them out at all. But there's always a chance of, you know, finding out about some possible things that you're missing if you think a little more about what you're trying to do. If you expand the boundaries a little bit, if you also think about what happens. Another good example that we are familiar with is irrigation efficiency. Irrigation efficiency increases something that we love as engineers, policymakers also love. We talk about the you know waste and you know, water waste in ag in agriculture. And a lot of in a lot of places, policymakers around the world have gone after increasing irrigation. What does irrigation efficiency do to water use in the agricultural sector? Okay. Reduce it. Why? It's more efficient. Right? That's that's what they think. But what happens? First, you lose recharge. You lose any return flow that you have. First thing, so you a lot of water which could get into you know infiltrate into groundwater is lost. Problem from the California. California had in during the drought because too, because of too much efficiency. Return flows are lost. Some of the environmental water share is lost that way. Um, the other thing is farmers are not stupid. We're making it efficient. That's good. I'm going to expand my land area, so farming area, or I change my crop for it for a thirstier crop. So anywhere in the world we have done it, we have faith. Still, people in the developing world are trying to do it. Right now in Iran, we're giving loans to farmers to do that. We're giving them incentives to do that. And people like myself, you know, try to get for not doing it, and then we were getting accused for, for you know, like crazy stuff. But, but, but this is the thing, that because the agriculture sector, what we're thinking about, water shortage, a lot of ways, let's solve this problem, and then don't think about the rest of the problem. So these paradoxes, these failures exist. Now, my question is about how Global warming. Global warming. We have greenhouse gas. Yeah, you know what causes global warming? Greenhouse gas emissions. Where do they come from? Fossil fuels. How do we solve the problem? And use less water. Right. So this is the policy. So are we considering the consequences, the unintended consequences of going crazy about renewables on? You know, with the no fossil fuel policy on other sectors. Are we trying to solve the problem and create a new problem? When I appeared in, you know, in, in climate change negotiations, the only cop that I led the Iranian delegation, my point, you know, in my three minutes that I got to speak, my point was where is water in the whole game? Where's water? I mean, the Paris Agreement, you go over it, there's no, like, water is not there because those, those who run the show, most of the not those who run the show, in, for example, in, in, uh, and have been successful in renewable development, are, are in, in Europe. They had other in, intentions, they had other motives to develop their energy sector through renewables. Why? Because they were energy dependent. And they had other motives. So they, it made a lot of sense for them to make so, you know, a certain uh, level of investment. Now we have the countries in the Middle East who think that differently. We have the country, you know, China and India who think differently. We have the president of the United States who think differently because their status is different. 
Now, someone doesn't want to do this for, you know, not losing votes, and someone doesn't want to do it for So that's the second, that was the second thing, linear, we, we think linear. What is the third thing? When we model the system and provide solutions, when we think about solving a complex problem, we normally make an assumption, an important assumption that is hidden, and that is, perfect we assume without knowing that there is perfect cooperation between all the stakeholders for the good of the system, for the common good, to solve the global warming problem, to solve the water shortage problem in California, to solve the environmental problems in Iran. And, and even when we're dealing with multiple stakeholders, we turn the problem into multi-objective programs, multi-objective models, multi-criteria models. When we do that, we inherently assume that there is perfect cooperation between the elements. So this is the assumption that we have in most of our models. What results this implies is that you have a leader, a dictator, who can't tell the world what to do. This dictator can't tell the world what to do, and all, all, all those people around them would, would say yes to it because it's good for the system. Let's maximize the GDP. Everyone says yes, so I'm going to fire you, 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 because if you were to stay at home, you'd be better for the you know, economy of this country. Would you do that? I'm going to do this, you and you and you. You shouldn't farm almond, and you should you know, be farming this, or you should stay at home because you know, this species of fish is not there. And would people do that? So the assumption that we are making in a lot of these models, including integrated assessment models that we run for the whole world, is that there is perfect cooperation between the elements and everyone would listen to. It. But the reality is that individual rationality dominates group rationality. This is the way the universe is working. And, and people care, countries, stakeholders, group, decision makers, care about their benefits, and they have their own utility function that they try to maximize, not the utility function that we assume for the whole system. People in this famous figure know that through cooperation they can do a better job, but when they're in that situation, you know, there is chaos. People compete. Whoever gets in front and, and takes water out and, and so on, right? Individual rationality matters. The way we use water resources. You know, now, now put these people in a lot of, you know, in their farms and give them different wells. Still, they do the same, you know, show the same behavior. Pump out, pump out, pump out. Don't they then know that their the level of water will drop? They know. When they know that in the future they might go out of business, they know. Why do they do it? Because they have tons of reasons for doing it. When we cannot come up with, with solutions for the problem. And then, you know, we have all these different notions, even in, 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 in our conventions and agreements and, 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 and different declarations about efficient, fair, you know, like all these, all these buzzwords that we put there. What is the definition of fair? What is the definition of efficient when you talk about a transparent system? Fairness, equity, all these things. These are buzzwords. Definition of freedom. What is the definition of freedom? What is the definition? So these are the words that have different notions. And that's another problem you face, you, you face because then stakeholders would start rejecting what you are suggesting as a first solution, as we are seeing in, for example, the climate change negotiations. Now, when we talk about decision makers, when we talk about like you know players, we think this one is irrational, that country is stupid, this 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 decision maker out of like you know is stupid. No, they're all rational. They're all rational. A person who sacrifices his, his, his life for saving another person is rational and has a certain utility function in which he, he weighs different things differently. And a person who exposes himself to kill some others also have also has his own rationality, you know, function and utility function, reward function, and there are major things in his head which drives him to do, do that. It's not stupidity. It's stupidity based on my model of human behavior, but not based if I understand them. Now, now you have all these people on Earth who make different decisions, who think differently, who 
do things differently, weigh things differently, well, different objectives, how can I come up with a model which works for everyone? I can never come up with a model which works for everyone. That's fine. But you know, let's understand that you know the people who we make fun of a lot of times are pretty smart. Are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. The, the policy, I mean, the, he has been successful in, in talking to a group of people that we, you know a lot of people ignored. He has been very successful in his Twitter policy. This guy was was successful in winning votes world, at some point. This guy. So these populists that we, we sometimes don't like and, and we make fun of as university people and as the elite and smart people, they're rational. They know their game. But their games is different. These guys want to get reelected. So what they care about is let's make it cheap, let's make it happy, let's lower the taxes, let's do this, let's do that, let's get rid of this, because people need to be happy. Who cares about the future of this, this country? I mean, Donald Trump keep talking about environmental problems in Iran. Environmental problems in Iran. He doesn't care about the environmental problems here. He has an EPA like you know head as, as a co-lobbyist. He's he's getting out of the Paris Agreement, but he keeps talking about environment in Iran. Why? Because he has an objective. He has a political objective. That's why he talks about it. And he gets so he's not stupid. He knows what he's doing. When he's here, he, he games with climate change, he makes fun of it. Because there are certain people who read that and use that. Conflicts would exist, cooperation would exist, because it's not that I'm saying that because of all these problems and individual rationality that we have, we don't have cooperation. We end up having cooperation. But conflicts are also there, and they're integral to any sort of management of, of natural resources. And when you play bring in these things into your models, a lot of things would be different. I just briefly give you an example of the work we did in Alaska on energy planning. And the you know city of Fairbanks, Alaska, you can think about energy shortage problem in Alaska, but city of Fairbanks has energy problems and, and, and energy supply problems. They had about like you know eight or nine um, energy alternatives that they were thinking about and, and then they were wondering which one is the best. So all of them have like you know these performance different performance criteria and so on. So we get into this game, we try to understand what's going on and how we can model this. And one thing we asked for was okay which which politician supports which party? As soon as we asked this question, they, they were like, really, like, they were like, we are state school, we're not going to model politicians. Like, if you don't model politi the politicians of the state, there's no way you can make any projection, any meaningful projection. And if you want to help the situation, you better do it, even if, like, you know, we're maybe like sensitivity analysis and, and played with it. But, but the, the whole point was, as soon as you bring the politics of the state into the game, Things would be absolutely different from the assumptions you made, like you know you previously made, and then the projects which are you know have a chance of getting accepted or or be implemented are the ones which don't have strong haters or buffers. The other things that you face is, for example, like I mean one example was job creation as one criteria. Is job cre creation a good good thing or a bad thing? If there are more jobs, are you happy? There were people who were saying job creation means more immigrants in the region created, right? So the way people think, even about the same criteria, the way that like you know the performance is different. So hey, what we what we what our results say said was amazing. What we we predicted in a few months was getting the highest chance. A few months later, the, the oil prices, the gas prices changed. Our results used us. So because the whole market, the global market has changed. We fail, yes, because we can't get everything right. Now, in negotiations, that's another thing. We keep talking about, let's solve this problem. The whole world is ignoring this climate change problem. Yes, but there are things that we know, like, I mean, everyone knows. But one thing is about process of negotiation, people getting together, getting in a room, taking photos. The other is about, what do they, do they need to trade? We can sit together, we can negotiate, we can get in the room. I was one of them, so like, you know, taking good gestures and making all these, you know, promises. But when you think about it, so climate change negotiation, who gives you what, like, to do what? And that's the whole game. That's why we don't make any progress, because if you want the developing world to 
make changes to energy development policies, you have to give them something. You cannot ask the you know, OPEC countries and the OECD countries, like you know, all the countries which now think they're in their development phase to stop their development because we screwed it up earlier than you and it was a bad thing, like look at the pollution we have, we don't want to get there. They don't think that. They say, okay, we're not saying that we're not going to develop renewables, but just pay us. And this doesn't make progress because we keep talking. Politicians love processes. Substance is what we scientists need to come up with, consultants need to come up to say that this is what you can trade. And that is a lot of times not our concern because we think about the optimal for the region, optimal for the world, for the problem we are solving, but we are not thinking about who needs to trade what in the system. One, you know, nuclear negotiations of Iran was a good example. Iran for a long time was negotiating over the number of centrifuges that they were going to use, you know, their hand. At some point, the hardliners went off and, and the negotiation parties actually learned. I mean, even this guy, after like about two years, that if we keep talking about this, it's a zero something. Well, what if I trade centrifuges for planes, airplanes, for a better access to the global market? So that they sanction, oh yeah, you guys are freezing our money for like 40 years, let's give that some of that back. By the way, we have these hostages or like prisoners who we can trade. So when you open up, when you link issues, then you can come up with solutions. So issue linkage is a game that we have to play. Again, we need to expand to see all, all those other things that we normally don't see in our things. When we do these things, you know, then we have this challenge of like, you know, we have our own limited space and universe around us, and the politicians do the same. Now, we also have like, you know, the public versus scientists, the public versus politicians, the NGOs, activists, all these groups. Now, if you if you want, you know, if we said, if I say one, one is, uh, you know, one is the, uh, one of these is the decision maker, and one is the scientist. Which one is the scientist? You're not arrogant at all. <laughs> so, so this is the game we have. Like, I mean, every side think that you guys are emotional with your models and your graphs. You don't understand how the world works. So for a politician, politician sees himself here. And, and, and then we get into this judgment game. But the reason is that we don't talk to each other. I was doing you know, policy this year. Uh, and I was very proud of being connected to a lot of policymakers, not only in Iran, but also in other countries in the region. And, and that's, that feels good. You testify, they invite you, you go to talk to this parliament member, uh, the minister is taking notes, or standing in front of you, and then you have like all these bodyguards around you. It feels good. But then, then, then you know, this, this thing about, you know, when I get into the game, the fourth gap I realized was not actually about any science policy that we talked about, but was also the, the element of society that I missed. I indeed had done a lot of media work with the public. But I never like valued that. I never, you know, I, I admit that I discounted the value of society and all these things. So when I go to Iran, then I, I you know, I get invited to Iran to go back and say, and, and this was perhaps happening for the first time for anyone after the revolution, a person who doesn't have any political tie to the system, an expert outside, no family ties, and gets called to go back and serve at a high level. So when I go home and, and I talk, then I have this situation. This is what I'm presenting. This is what the art I see. I say we don't have water. And you think I'm, I'm trying to criticize the energy dependence policy. I'm trying to make the country westernized. And I'm trying to kind of make the country west. So this issue of perspective. The other thing was like as soon as I sit behind the desk, like even those activists and public, like a lot of NGOs who were supporting me, now they're suspicious. What if I'm like, you know, behind closed doors, I'm doing this and I'm making so this game became a, a, an important game. Even the same narrative was being misinterpreted in the same way. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same problem, but then it was like a lot of fights, a lot of, and, and then my, my, my main, you know, so, so then on a Sunday I get appointed on my, on my London 
celebration. Everyone is happy. Like it's it's all the you know on Monday it's all over the news. Sunday social media celebration. Monday afternoon people start talking about why would you bring the scientists into politics? Let them be in, you know be productive in in, in at, at university. Tuesday morning online media starts talking about. How is like BBC, MIC, why ended up on Iran's government? <laughs> Wednesday morning, I arrived in Taiwan, I get arrested. Like, I, I had not even started my job. I had not said a single word, just a tweet that I'm excited about coming back. And, and then I get, and, and seven months later, after getting interrogated, you know, detained, getting detained, um, arrested, on, so, so a lot of problems. I, End up staying, like you know, leaving in, in a funny way and like in a very lucky way. And we still have, like, a, you know, for more than a year, we have had a bunch of environmental activists, uh, workers in Iran, who are in jail. And what is that? You know, you know, of course, I they all kind of knew. And and you know, miscommunication, misunderstanding, not talking to people, not not not, and and a lot of things was about like the values. A lot of questions about like me was like, oh, you're a dual national, and I was saying I'm not a dual national. And they were like, well, you were living for so long in you know abroad, and you were not a dual national because what they wanted is an army passport. I didn't want it. I didn't feel I needed a passport. I was already on the side of the world. They were like, you know, questioning why? Why didn't you even come back? Why would a person come back after so many years? Because everyone wants to get out, and you're coming back. And like a lot of interrogations, a lot of questions were about this value system. They were like, you know, we haven't communicated. And now take it to technical, to the technical stuff, to the technical, you know, stuff about water. So I was called a water terrorist because I'm trying, to, I'm talking about water shortage too much, and I'm trying to shut down the agricultural sector. You know, create tension, water wars in the country, uh, create another ISIS. I was called a bio terrorist because I'm shutting down the agricultural sector, make the country food dependent. We're going to import GMOs and destroy the next generation genetically. I was called like you know a betrayer and a traitor for for trying to ratify the Paris Agreement so the country's development would be limited. Statement that Trump makes also. So so all these things because that like you know the state of like you know where the experts are standing and the society. Yes, the hardliners and radicals have their own propaganda and a lot of that. But a lot of this is because of I mean my conclusion. I and mean, it makes a lot of people angry when I say it because they want to play everything on politics. But it's because you're dealing with an uninformed society, a misinformed community. So a misinformed and uninformed community can select, you know, elect Trump, can vote for Brexit, can vote for like you know the populist policymakers wherever they are. When I play games with students, a lot of times my results are like what my observations are very different from any sort of modeling I do with game theory. When I go to different parts of the world and talk to those who share water, example, like in the, in the Nile, and talking to people, expecting wars and conflicts, in a country like Rwanda, that they have just like, you know, done a genocide like, you know, not long ago. You see people peaceful, happy, like, you know, and all my like, you know, assumptions are, are useless. And like, you know, my questions are even confusing to them. Like, how, how often do you fight? Do you like, what do you think you have so, so, so then my conclusion is that this, this thing that we're too focused on policy, and we get rewarded in the academia for, for make, having a policy impact, but not much for going to a high school or elementary school and lecture. In my career, my, my hardest lecture ever, and I've been in, in, in very crazy lectures with you know, people sitting and talking, you know, has been the one I did for the sixth graders in, in Florida on, on sustainability. Um, where people were like, you know, asking so funny questions about, like, you know, so I was talking about supply chain and effect of this and this and this and that, and then a student raises his hand and says, oh, professor, we thought God makes decisions for everything. Right? I didn't even know how to do that. <laughs> so, so, and, and then, so, so going back to this thing, it's, it's, it's not about complexity. It's really good that we can't, we have complex models. We have a strong computational capacity. A lot of things that we are just repeating. Sociohydrology, this, that, like, you know, just, they're like, we, we, we just rebranding a lot of things that we have. Integrated water resources management has been there forever. Now, add nexus, this, that, that, sustainability science, now SDGs, like all these things that we rebrand and we sell, they're good. You, you can push things forward, but they're not really like, you know, the, the things that, 
our game changes. What what we need to change is the way, like you know, our understanding of the problem. So in hardware water program, if you look at it, a lot of things that we're talking about today are the things that we were talking about in the 60s and 70s. But they couldn't. I mean, they were not able to do it because they didn't have enough computational capacity. They didn't have enough data, and there was no understanding of these complexities. Now we have to understand that the world is might, might be more complex than we thought because of the problems we created. We have super, you know, a lot of computational capacity, and we have a lot of data. And that's scary because we can create all these co correlations, all these fancy word maps, colorful maps that can get us nature and science publications. But a lot of times we don't understand the complexities within the system. The art and the skill is to develop the simplest model possible for the most complex problem and can understand it. So are these models helping our understanding? And that's another point to, you know, that I wanted to draw. bring up. Thank you. No, I'm fine. Okay. Um, <laughs> any question? Any question? So basically, you're saying, you said, you talked about uh, linear thinking, and you have to change that one. Uh, you need more than one individual, one group to solve the problem. You really need to work together. Otherwise, you fail because nobody can have that much expertise in all those areas. Sorry, Reza, it's very hard to hear you. Can you speak louder? I, re I repeat the question. I repeat. Okay. So, so the question is that, like, uh, is the message, uh, I mean, of, of things talking about linear thinking, uh, is, is the message uh, that we need to, uh, groups need together, and, uh, need to get together and solve the problem because one, one group doesn't have one, there's no one group which has all the expertise. Uh, yes, if we claim that we can solve the problem. The thing is, we don't have to bring everyone in the, in the same room. Uh, it depends on what sort of problem we try to solve and what we claim at the end. If, if, you know, so, so that is the thing. We don't have that expertise. We don't have that view, but we present our solution and we say that we have solved the whole world's problem. So the thing is to, to adjust your, I think, the message is to adjust your, the, the, the problem definition, first of all, what are you trying to achieve? The boundaries of the system that you're studying, you know, find the right expertise for the boundaries that you're considering, then you can report what you have missed and what you have accomplished. So, so you can make solve a tiny problem or, or a large problem. In either way, you have things that you're missing. But yeah, I mean, then the other caveat is that if we need those interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary stuff, then we end up like, you know, something that the social scientists at least were, you know, hate very much. Hey, I'm writing this, and I said, call my main need a social scientist. Can you be the social scientist? And they're like, what do you need us to do? It's like surveying. <laughs> they hate it. They hate it because that's not like, I mean, so so that's our view, and, and it's cool to have people of different disciplines. And a lot of things, you, a lot of times you get really things that are not organic and groups that eventually they, they, they take their share of money and they keep doing what they were doing. Okay. Um, so, question. Yeah. Um, a scientist kind of like collect policy or like the state or something like policy. And then if um, it's only when we do engage with policymakers, we engage like the different perspectives that are going on, you know, in the Senate, in the House, um, that leads to like the implementation of, you know, their renewables or like more sustainable resources. Do you think that, um, I guess the question is, how do you think we can better engage the public? Or like, should scientists advocate or organize to say what talk we should do so the public can better understand the science that we're doing so that it would be sustainable? Um, you know, sustainable engineering or, you know, better energy systems like, um, are generally accepted by the public? Okay, so, so the question, if I understand correctly, is, is how can scientists interact with the public in a better way, okay? Um, so, 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 so here's the thing. Again, as I, you know, I believe that not every person in, in 
in the scientific world and in academia should become interdisciplinary and disciplinary. That's not even healthy when I come in there. It takes certain characters, like it fit me, needs to fit your personality, your appetite, the things you like, and that's the first thing. So this fashion is not good and this trend is not good. The other thing is not every scientist should do advocacy work because that's also unhealthy. There are some of us who get in front of camera, they're comfortable with camera, but we, we sell wrong stuff. And, and we kind of monopolize this space. And, and do. So, so, but I think, you know, what I, from experience, the reason that at some point, even sitting sitting as, as a politician, I was at a high level and I had power to do a lot of things. But I realized that like the people that who were, you know, some of them were like dreaming having someone like me in office, are now resisting about like, you know, when I talk about, let's, you know, I was running campaigns on garbage collection, talking about like plastic and, you know, putting a ban on plastic bottle water. And they were like, oh, you're ignoring the water problem and you're, you know, distracting people to, to garbage. Like, this is not like policy, right? So my, my thing was, oh, like, wait a minute. I need to discuss things with people. I need to talk to people more often. So then they, you know, so I can affect their value system. I can develop a narrative that is, is healthy. So speaking with people results in, in a narrative. Everyone has a narrative. All politicians have narratives. Sometimes these are just wrong narratives because no one paid attention to them. Sometimes they're intentionally wrong narratives. A lot of times they're just incomplete narratives, right? So, so you know, a lot of people talk about climate change, but they're confused about what to do with it. In, in Iran, if you ask people about Water shortage, everyone's like they lecture for you for you know two hours, but they're like, you know, washing the street with a with a hose, and they're like, you know, this goddamn like you know, government is not paying attention to this valuable reason because they don't understand. Like, same thing in California. Same thing, like people don't they're you know, so so the thing is about talking to people. Climate change is one of those areas that actually has had huge investment, but still we have failed. Because we have not developed the, the right narrative for the public. We have not communicated properly with the public. We have not spent time with the public with this. Because, because even, even in, in dictatorships, even in dictatorships, policymakers are responsive to an extent to what people expect. Those expectations are you know, formed by their beliefs and then knowledge and information. Unless they know their beliefs and expectations would not be different. And then the politicians are responsive to what they want. To have an a, 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 like, like environmental an environmentally informed society, you need politicians who care about the environment and invest a lot in public information. And to have those, such politicians, you need people who care about the environment who ask the politicians. So it's a chicken and egg problem. Now, our role is to change that game by talking to both communities, but, but a lot more to those who are around us. Our, our, our tenure system, our like, you know, this is the university evaluation process might not value that, but I think there is a lot of value and a lot of power actually to us to, to speak more to people and speak out actually and not speak up. Any last question? Yeah. Yeah, thank you for the inspiring talk. Now let's talk about water. That is what is happening when you are selling the water scarcity in the system. In which we manage to avoid that discussion, that we have this additional feedback because you have to take the help to be able to get these kind of conditions. I'm thinking, like, would that be a recommendation that's going to be? I mean, again, I think there the 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 you know what worked was was that like you know simple message because what we realized was. While we can get publications with the complex figure, we cannot get public attention with the complex figure. We cannot get the politician's attention. But this this analogy of you know painkiller and, and infection and, and, and this is something that people would 
listen to with, with understand. You can make a one minute one minute message on it and people hear. Right? So that was I think this this thing again about one thing that we don't do is is, is the translation of what we have done. The complex paper that we have written, how do you explain it to your children, grandparents, cousins, like people who are out of your community in public? This is that you know something one one thing that most of us are not good at. Um, I also give you an example. So so after returning from you know we did this. Um, it was a very short, like you know, nature paper on on nature sustainability, not even nature, but on the shade balls that were used in California for evaporation suppression. They became like really famous on social media, and in the other part of the world, like people love them. Like you know, you throw these black balls on the reservoirs, and there's no evaporation, our problem solved, right? And then uh, it was my question, like I mean, all of these, I like this complexity game, was like. What is the water footprint of producing those bulbs, right? So we did this study, like how much water does it take to produce those bulbs? And, it, and then the results was like, it takes about two and a half years. So you like, you know, so it's like you get even. So you like, you pay the cost, the same thing is equal to the water being used. But I mean, of course you can argue that this, you know, this, these can be produced in, in Africa and can be taken here or somewhere water rich. Well, like, I mean, this, this complex now, now, so there was media attention to this, but this this group called Now This, they're very good in, on, on Twitter, on Facebook. They picked it up. They made, made a one, one minute video. They posted it on, on Facebook. They didn't end up on Twitter. But I think very shortly after, when I checked it, it was like two million something views. In my career, like, I mean, all of these publications, like, oh, I've never got that much attention. I, I didn't even have the expertise. They couldn't just say this funny story and then you could see like people trashing the Democrats for, for, for that. And this must be done like by a Democrat, like, you know, mayor. Like, I mean, their, their own conclusions and sometimes even false conclusions. But this is what, what they can do. Now, if we don't interfere, now they can get their, their wrong stories straight. And, and but once we start communicating and interacting with them, we can do the job. I think this is a step that we have to take uh, further. Now, like, you know, the highlights that we do for our Elsevier publications, they're horrible. Uh, they're not doing, uh, as a, or even the videos that we sometimes submit together with our publications. How do you get the message across? I was in charge of education and you know, outreach also, working with people. One of the most challenging things I was dealing with was finding groups who can produce content for different groups in the society, different age groups. They didn't have, like, even how they're, those who are experts, didn't have, like, I, I couldn't see a lot of innovation and new things and ideas there, and that, that was serious. Thank you so much, Carlos.